raptures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their country by another way. The Gospel of the Lord. We celebrate this feast of the Epiphany of the Lord. We have this all too familiar image of the three Magi that come to offer their gifts to the Lord. We often just think of it as, oh, it's this beautiful little moment where these three kings come and they have their little items that they place before baby Jesus and then they make their way. But this feast is significantly more important than just that. These Magi are not Jews. They are not Israelites, and yet they come to worship the king of Israel. And indeed, what we celebrate with this feast of the epiphany of the Lord is the revelation of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. That these non-Jews come to worship the king of Israel because he is not just the king of Israel, he is the king of all kings. That he is the glory of the only begotten Son of God manifested in the flesh. And that now salvation is offered through him, not just to the people of Israel, but to all the nations. To all the nations. I don't know about you, but I personally am a Gentile. I don't have any Jewish heritage. So this is a very important feast. That salvation is offered to us who don't partake of the people of Israel. And in a powerful way, we're held, or what's set before us today is this image of the glory of God. The glory of God hidden, present, in a little child. And that now it's through Jesus that salvation is offered to all. But it's very important to recognize that under no other name, or through no other name, under heaven or on the earth, do we find salvation. That it is only, only in Jesus that we can experience redemption. As you hear in today's first reading from the book of Isaiah, the people find themselves covered in darkness under a dark cloud. And this isn't just referring to the cloudy weather that we experience here in Michigan. This is referring to the darkness of sin. We're told that through the envy of the devil, sin entered the world, and through sin, death, division, despair, brokenness, all of the bad things we see in the world. But yet a great light shines on this people Israel, that from them a glory will be revealed, a light will shine, and all people will be drawn to this light. All people will be drawn to this glory that shines in the darkness. And of course we know who this is, that God chooses to take on our human flesh in Jesus Christ. That he becomes one of us to redeem us, to reconcile us to the Father. And that now through faith in Jesus Christ, through professing adoration before his throne, we are offered the gift of eternal life. The gift of redemption from our sins, redemption from our brokenness. And indeed, the Magi set out for us today an incredible example. If we take note of what actually happens as they come to Jesus... Again, oftentimes we see these images, even our, our creche, not to say it's, it's not beautiful, but oftentimes it's just sort of this image of them just setting their gifts before the Lord. But if we read closely in today's gospel, we're told as they come before him, they fall prostrate on their faces. They fall down before the glory of God in this little baby. To be very clear, it's likely that Jesus wasn't glowing or something like that. <laughs> It wasn't like this baby had a halo visibly over his head. But these magi, by faith, recognize the presence of God here. And they don't just sort of set their gifts at his feet. They fall down prostrate before the glory of his majesty. They fall down and worship him. And this is what we are made for. <laughs> this is what we're invited to is to live in a posture of worship and adoration before the Lord. Indeed, in, in face, in light of this incredible mystery 
of the glory of God taking on our human flesh in a little child, the only proper response is worship, is adoration, is just placing ourselves before him. And what a mystery it is that throughout the Gospels or throughout the Scriptures, we see these different instances of angels appearing as representatives of God. And we often see people just literally fall flat on their faces because of the glory of God present in these angels. And oftentimes the angel has to correct the person, don't worship me, I'm not God. And to imagine the the glory of who God is, the incredible majesty, the mystery of the splendor of our God. And yet he chooses to conceal it, to keep it in a way hidden, mysteriously hidden, in this little baby. That he is present here, fully God and fully man. And these magi, by faith, bow down and worship before him. And we are invited to do the same. Throughout the the course of this season, throughout the course of this past year, we keep coming back to this theme of, of recognizing that the Lord is still in control. To be very clear, Jesus doesn't will evil. Our Lord doesn't will evil. That is impossible. However, he can permit it. I was recently listening to a talk from another uh, Christian speaker, very uh, on-fire person, and, and he was uh, sharing with the, the congregation a word that the Lord had spoken to him. He was in a place of frustration early on during the pandemic, and just sort of lamenting to Jesus his frustrations and his anger. And Jesus said very clearly to him, Do you think that a world pandemic happens without the King of Kings knowing it? Of course the answer is no. No, it doesn't. So you might ask, well, what is the Lord about in permitting such great difficulty or such great trial? Is he's offering opportunity after opportunity for us to shake out, to clear out in our lives the idols that we have. The places that we look to to actually save us. Because these things are being revealed for what they truly are, that they cannot possibly offer us the hope of eternal life. That our economy, our political leaders... None of these realities can offer us eternal life. These different things that we look to to save us, they can't possibly offer us the gift of salvation. That it is only in Jesus that we can receive this gift. And throughout the course of this trial or this difficulty, we're being offered an invitation to imitate the Magi and bowing down and worshiping him. Jesus, I come to you. Lord, I repent of the places that I've looked to to, for salvation in my life. Jesus, I repent of placing my hope in these false idols in my life. I repent of looking to people other than you to save me. Maybe for some of us it might not be a a place of idols, but it might be we're just crippled by fear and anxiety right now. We can repent of that. Jesus, I repent of giving in to the fear and anxiety which the media seeks to sow in my heart and in my life. Jesus, I repent of giving in to this place of hopelessness, of despair, of thinking that the darkness is too great for the power of your light. Jesus, I repent and I surrender this place to you. I ask for the grace to worship you and you alone, that I might bow down before the glory of your throne. I might bow down before the glory of who you are. If we want to enter more deeply into this worship, of course we experience this every single time we come to Mass. That we're offered this opportunity to kneel down, to bow down before the glory of God present in the Most Blessed Sacrament. And of course another immediate place that we experience this connected to the Mass is Eucharistic adoration. (laughs) We're offered an opportunity to bow down before his presence there. Just adoring Christ, the King of all kings, present in his blessed sacrament. Just one other place that I'd invite us to is just to take time actually in song. Actually in song, worshiping the Lord. There's a way in which when we enter into worship, when we sing of the Lord's goodness, when we sing to him, not just about him, but we sing to him of his goodness, there's a way in which worship helps to reorient or restructure our lives. Placing first things first. Placing our worship and our adoration with the only person with whom it actually belongs, with Jesus. With the Lord. And there's a way in which when we enter into worship, I just experienced this a few days ago. Just being in a place of of just some pain and difficulty coming up in my heart. 
And as we enter into worship, the Lord just gives us access to the deep places in our hearts. If we look back at the the images uh, in the catacombs in Rome, some of the first images of Christians, they're often depicted with their hands raised, just in a posture of surrender and adoration before Jesus. And, And we can do this. We can... We have this beauty of modern media, modern technology, that you can put on worship songs when you go home. You can play them when you're driving. You can just put on songs and enter in and just sing to the Lord of his goodness. And as we imitate the Magi in this way, our lives and our hearts are set right. That when the king who's intended, who's meant to reign on the throne of our hearts, actually reigns there, everything else is going to fall into place. Not to say our lives won't be difficult or there won't be challenges, but it can change our vision of reality. We would recognize we don't live under darkness or the shadow of death, but rather we live under the glory of the only begotten Son of God revealed in the flesh. As we enter in to celebrate this feast, my brothers and sisters, let us ask the Lord for the grace to recognize in our hearts the places that maybe we've placed our hope other than the Lord. We would recognize these false idols, these things in which we cling to to save us. And as we become aware of these places, to simply repent. (laughs) To simply repent. If it's a place of fear, if it's a place of anxiety, just to bring it to Jesus today. And to ask him for the grace to imitate the Magi in falling prostrate before his glory present in the flesh.